Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and Complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and Complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Gregor Leinburgut, who is the director of the Cath Lab and of Complex Interventions at the University Hospital in Basel, Switzerland. Gregor, thanks again for being with us today. Super excited to learn from you about your trip learning CTO interventions. Thank you very much, Manos, for your kind invitation to this excellent podcast series that you have. I just recently found it out on, on the internet and I'm really excited and it's a really a big honor that I can be part of it. No, it's, it's, we're excited about it. And I know that you've really uh, been very creative and created a super program in your previous institution and currently. And you did that at a you know very young age and being able to tackle a lot of complex and explain things in a very, very clear way for people to learn. So you're the best person for, for the Sensei podcast. But how did this all start for you? How did you decide to tackle um, CTOs and complex interventions? So thank, thank you very much first for the compliment, which I, I really appreciate. Um, it's been a long way, a long journey. So like basically I'm very interested in uh, uh, carpentry and, and building things at home. So I have a basement with a lot of machinery. I'm actually welding on a go-kart right now, an electric oh. go-kart. Uh, so it's been uh, manual work. It's been my interest all along. And initially when I started doing medicine, I was uh, interested in um, orthopedics. And I also started doing orthopedics for a year. And then it was kind of too boring and too mechanical. And I learned a lot about hemodynamics and I got more interested in cardiology. And then I switched towards cardiology. Having done that, I was missing all the manual work. And then I saw the cath lab and I saw the kind of a combination with it. And then I got interested in all the tools and the wires, the mic catheters, the physics behind it. Um, and I think I can, I can dream about mic catheters all day. And that's why I'm I'm so much engaged in it, and I learned a lot about the, the the material science behind. So you started as an orthopedic surgeon training, and then you switched. So that's a I think that's the first one that we've heard before. But you're right; it's both manual work and it's three dimensional uh, visualization and thinking. Um, but you know, there's PCI and there's complex PCI and there's structural, and no peripheral is a different uh, category in Europe. But why CTO, for example, and not structural? Um. Yeah, a good, good question. Um, I was trained in Bad Krotzingen from Achim Büttner. And, and interestingly, you know, funnily, uh, he was doing all the CTOs in, in Lab 9 back then, and I was never in the Lab 9. And I was more interested in regular PCI. And I thought CTO PCI are long durations, uh, pr demanding procedures, radiation, all the downside of, uh, of CTO PCI. I only saw those aspects, and I, I actually didn't like doing CTO PCI. And I thought it's more interesting to do STEMIs and, uh, and acute work. And only after I left there and I started in my, my hospital, previous hospital, I learned that there's actual, actually patient need and there's people with uh, CTOs that are on long-term anti-ischemic uh, um, therapy. They're still symptomatic. They keep coming back and people say you, you cannot treat it. And there I, I wanted to find a way to help these patients. And then I got more and more into complex stuff. And then while doing it, being successful, having the patients coming back, being happy, um, tremendous uh, benefit. Um, I, I, I thought it, it, it's, it's actually the way I want to go. And now it's the first part that I said, it's, it's the material science, the complexity, all these techniques that we develop, um, the hybrid approach. And uh, this is what, what engages me to do, to go further and, and participate and also contribute to the field. Wonderful. And how did you actually learn? So you were in a, one of the best labs, uh, right, for CTO, but you didn't learn it there, so you learned it somewhere else. So how did that, how did that process go? Um, a lot of things were doing 
just on the, on the regular day uh, work and then I struggled with some issues and then I went to meetings I learned online I, I read your books and uh, I also invited uh, fa um, faculty that was more experienced back then it was uh, Achim Büttner who was my mentor and because Bad Krotzing was very close it's a couple of uh, hour uh, minutes uh, ride by car so I invited him over to help me out proctor me do some workshops together and then I was also lucky to um, get to know all other operators during the, the meetings like this one here in New York, but also other other others like the MLCTO. And, and the whole community is really positive. They're great people, genius people, but they're all very helpful and, and close. So you can actually just go there and talk to them and they invite you. I remember Bill Lombardi invited me to Seattle 10 years ago and I could spend a couple of weeks at his lab. He now came back to my place to support me with a life case and everybody in the community was really supportive and that, that, that was a great experience and I could learn through it and uh, gradually I grew there and now I, I want to do the same thing. I want to contribute to the community. And what was the most difficult thing for you to learn? What did you find? Is it the microcutters, the wires? Is it the thinking? What was the hardest thing for you? Um, mentally, it was going suboptimal. Like the first time I, I pushed the wire and I, I knew it's going to go suboptimal with a big knuckle, having a huge uh, suboptimal hematoma potentially um, that I could not solve at the end of the case. That was mentally, that was the biggest hurdle. Other than that, learning new materials, how to spin microcatheter was not a problem because basically my my tinkering background maybe so I'm, I'm really jumping onto new material quickly and understand it i think so this was not the issue handling gear and lots of wires and dual dual access and things like that uh, it was more basically the, the adr and not being able to to re-enter and how do you plan for your cases you have a specific routine a way to look at the films or talk to the patients. How do you plan the cases today? Yeah, maybe I shouldn't say that here because I'm a little bit unconventional. Conventional because uh, the, at the place where that I worked the last ten years, we only had one cat lab, so we were a little bit restricted on resources, and I could not. And also, the the, the regulations were a little bit different than in the US. Um, I was not always able to um, put the patient down think about the angio plan weeks ahead so in some cases or actually in a lot of cases i, I did uh, a talk c to pci um but still i mean you have to look at the angiogram you have to do setup shots but it's just been done a couple of minutes before i actually started the procedure so i, I kind of had to adopt quickly and 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 uh, assess a situation and anatomical situation quickly and maybe that was also kind of a training that uh, pushed me forward in, in doing this. So you had to think quickly and, and get this done because of the logistics uh, locally. Yes. And how supportive was the local team? Did you have to train your team, your techs, your nurses? Uh, were they supportive? Were they complaining? How did that work? Well, they were both because uh, in the beginning, obviously complaining. When I started at that place, we had through about two to three angios a day or patients a day. And when I left, it was, uh, was about sixfold uh, the amount. So going somewhere and with a team that had been doing low um, um, amounts of patients and pushing them to do more cases, longer cases, um, it, it, was a, it was a changing moment for them. And obviously there was some uh, resistance in the beginning, but soon they saw the benefits of that. Uh, they, they, they were interested in, in the complexity of the cases, but they all saw that uh, the, these patients came back and, and were well treated. So there was kind of a um, moment of change. And at the end, everybody loved it. And we had a big, big support. And sometimes, even if I was getting tired after a couple hours, they said, well, why don't you go on and try this or that wire? Even the nurses were suggesting strategies that they have observed. So it was a kind of, really, really positive environment and, and great to work with. So do you sit down with them? Do you discuss the cases with them? How do you interact with the group? 
Yeah, the, the, the way we work uh, or I worked is that I was uh, a single operator and I had a nurse with me at the table, which was the person basically being the second operator, also helping me exchanging my catheters and everything. So they were really engaged and we were basically a team of a doctor and a nurse working on the patient. So they were really deeply involved. We also discuss cases afterwards or in, in rounds, of course, to educate them because I truly believe it's a team approach. It's not just doctors and the nurses be there to bring in the patient or prepare the patient. It's, it's, I think it's also a mental team approach uh, uh, during the case. And I was really lucky to, to have that there uh, with this, with this team. You know, when it comes to complications and challenges, how do you deal with these issues? Uh, do you get depressed? Uh, are you able to handle them well? How do you deal with them? Um, well, I, I would say over the years, I, I, I obviously had a couple of uh, complications, some more severe. And uh, when I look back or when I assess myself, I, I'm, I'm a person that can be more calm during uh, the situation and try to be uh, objective and see all aspects and, and also uh, manage the team that comes in to resuscitate maybe the patient or helping. Um, so I'm kind of, and I think you can train that a little bit, but you also have to have this personality. And I, I think I, I, I'd be lucky to, to be that kind of person so that I don't scream around and, and get crazy. Because also you you lose your objectivity and then you you probably do more mistakes and you and also your team is afraid because then they cannot work if you if you shout at them. I had an experience way back when I was uh, 24. I was tour guide in Alaska um, for a year, so also a little bit uh, different. And we had an accident during a canoe trip, and there were two older ladies in my canoe that I was uh, rowing with, and we dipped over, and the water was like five degrees Celsius, so almost freezing, and and I just reacted quickly so there was no time to to think and and i saved them both from the river and that was the first time in my life i experienced uh, this situation that i can focus uh, in a disaster that i probably do the right things uh, because it, you cannot plan ahead and so this is kind of a personality aspect that helps me in CTO pci and how stressed are you during the case do you get anxious um do you get uh uh, on your edge, how do you keep your cool? How does it work for cases, light cases, and otherwise? Um, no, I don't think so. Because in the meantime, we have a lot of techniques. We we know bailout uh, options, and there, there's usually a, a plethora of of them. So I always know that I, if this fails, I can do this and that, and and f five more things. So we always have an option and a road ahead to go to bailout, and that I think this this calms me down. Um, um, but of course there's been situations where the patient gets unstable, where I was a little bit nervous because I don't have these options. It's usually these cases where you explored all options and, uh, they didn't work and, and you have a complication and you cannot, you cannot access it. I remember one case where we had a, a perforation in a proximal cirque bleeding and I stented it, it looked good angiographically. The patient got in shock a couple hours later. A uh, fellow called me and said, it looks like a tamponade, but I don't see any pericardial effusion. And then I remember the published case from, uh, I think it's Bill Lombardi, of a retroatrial hematoma. And I said, it must be that. And uh, we put the patient to CT and we saw it, a dual by uh, atrial retrograde, uh, retroatrial hematoma compressing the atria completely. The patient was without pressure uh, we did a ct guided puncture f f uh, from anterograde uh, from anterior actually through uh, luckily that he had a big 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 epicardial fat tissue we could puncture through the fat tissue and ob uh, avoid um, a lung injury and so this was a sit when i saw the hematoma i knew i cannot do anything because i cannot reach the cavity without an, a radiologist or any help from outside so th this this was i remember a situation where i was kind of lost and stuck because i had no options that uh, i that that's a, a feared situation but when when you have again when you have options i think it's it's easy to just go step by step and try them and do you think you were um, always like this? You were born with this ability to kind of focus in the moments of crisis? Is that something that you cultivated? How did this come along? 
Actually, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think it's it's. I came along with that, but also it's probably some result of of my life experience. But I've never done specific training. I've never tra taken a course or something like that. Uh, I think it's just part of my life. I don't know. How did you find yourself from Switzerland to Alaska <laughs> at age 24? <laughs> okay, I was. Uh, m my parents were uh, moving to Calgary, and uh, it happened that I was born in in uh, no Edmonton. I was born in Edmonton, so I had a Canadian passport as well, uh, dual citizen citizenship. Then, when I was in med school, I thought I'd take a year off, do something else. But I wanted to be independent, not supported by my parents, so I had to work. And obviously, you, I could work in Canada. Uh, back then, there was no internet, no cell phones. I remember myself going to the library and looking at the that the annual temperatures. I didn't even know a lot about Canada. I just looked at the warmest place and I said, okay, it's Vancouver. And I go there and see what happens. And then I, I founded this tour company and they hired me and... I did some office work during the winter, and then I was uh, doing bus driver and tour guide in the, in the summer. So it was kind of a coincidence. Perfect. That's a fairly unique way to get into the real life. Now, when it comes to teaching, do you tell? Can you tell the people that you see the proctor? They come to watch you, the fellows. Do you um, sense someone's going to be a good CTO, complex operator? Is it something that is hard to determine up front, or? Can you tell when you see someone, this is a great guy, it's going to be an amazing operator? Yes, I, I truly believe that. Um, I, I also th believe that this should be the way we, we train uh, future doctors or interventional cardiologists. The way it works right now is you do your uh, high school, med school, uh, specialization, then you become professor maybe, or you do like more research. And then by the time you're, you're hitting four, 35, all of a sudden you do, you do PCI, but maybe you're not a manual person, not, not somebody who who's, um, likes doing complex uh, PCI. So I don't think this is the, the right training. I would tr take potential uh, operators earlier in their career and, and observe them in an easy case. And I think you can immediately tell if somebody is skilled or not how they uh, approach the material, how they spin a microcatheter, for example, easy things. Um, and they might they might have a much steeper learning curve and achieve a, a better uh, outcome at the end in terms of complex complexity of, of what they can do. Um, a person who is less skilled can also, of course, uh, learn complex C to PCI, but the learning curve is, I guess, much 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 uh, shallower, and it takes more and more time. Um, so I think I yes, the answer is yes. I think you can you can tell right away if somebody's skilled or not. What if someone is very excited about it, very enthusiastic, but the scans are not the the best? Is there hope for that person? Yes, there is. I mean, there is there is always hope. Um, the question is only how old is this person? How much how much exposure does she or he get? And how long does it take uh, to trajectory to get there? And and if there's enough years left, so. But I mean, there's always hope. It's always a question of investment, how much, and 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 uh, what do you get out from it? And maybe better counsel that person towards doing something else where she or he has, is more skilled and has a easier path to go. Um, also, having said that, initially, with that you you see the, mecha the the manual skills somebody has, I truly believe that you should also be a good doctor and uh, and seeing the patient in the focus and not and not just the mechanics and open up this vessel. Um, you should you should also be a clinician. Uh, it's 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 also an important part of the CT operator, in my opinion. Perfect. And then uh, when it comes to teaching, I know that you've made some. Excellent illustrations, explaining things very, very clearly. Was that always coming natural to you? Is that something you work on? Is your engineering background? How did you, um, how develop the skills of explaining and drawing and making these nice illustrations? Uh, first, I think you explain best when you really understand the issues. So it takes time to to really de get deep down into details, and then it it facilitates explaining uh, things to other people. Um, the drawing it's probably from my grandmother. She was a painter and, and was really skilled in drawing. So I hope I I got some from her. 
And then, of course, it's practice. I like drawing all my life, and uh, now I'm I'm getting. You said I'm I'm young, but I I I feel I'm getting older. But so I have a lot of time in my life that I was drawing and could practice. And but again, I never took art lessons or anything uh, like scheduled. And uh, um, when it comes to you know juggling the things that you are doing, and I'm sure the cath lab is very busy, and before it was probably even busier, it will be even busier now. Um, how do you juggle the clinical work, the research that you are doing, the teaching, the meetings, the live cases? Um, I think you, it has to be a genuine interest because you're spending so much time. Um, you always hear about work-life balance. And uh, so people consider it work, but I consider it life. And it's also my hobby. Sometimes I'm, I'm joking and say I, I would p have a sea arm in my basement if I could. And work at night as well. So it's, it's, it's really a genuine interest, um, all aspects of complex PCI. Um, so to me, it's, it's a 24 hour thing. Also, having said that, I could not do it without, uh, my wife and, uh, and, and also my kids, um, accepting that and supporting me a hundred percent. Um, because I, I I'm sure uh, she, uh, she absolutely sees that aspect. That it's 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 like a genuine interest that I have uh, that I share, and she supports that one hundred percent. And I couldn't do it without. How old are your kids? Uh, four and seven. Goodness, you're busy. <laughs> <laughs> no question about it. Um, now, when it comes to um, keeping in good shape, do you exercise? Do you read? Do you meditate? I mean, what do you do to keep uh, focused and uh, get your keep your body in good shape? I used to uh, row a long time ago, um, and uh, then I basically gave up doing uh, specific sports, so I don't really do anything. Uh, I, I cycle to work, so this is an advantage of my new uh, place that I work. I can go by bike back and forth, it's a little bit uphill to go back. So I think that's my daily cycling that I do. How far is the? Oh, it's not too far. It's like uh, 20 minutes one way. And so it's 40 minutes cycling a day, but I think it's at least something. Um, Perfect. So that's what I do. And I like to do a lot of sports, but not on a regular basis. I, I've done uh, parach paragliding for a couple of years. I've done uh, kiteboarding a uh, couple of years, a little bit bi biking, and but then it ch changes after a couple of years, do something else. Do you bike for STEMIs? Um, <laughs> yes, I, I I did bike for STEMIs uh, about three three weeks ago, but usually it's like in the, at night, three in the morning, so I take the car. Not the best time, to yeah. Be, to be honest, I'm a little lazy. No, well, you know, biking to work every day, that's not, uh, that's not lazy, but... Um, when it comes to um, the things that you enjoy, do you have any favorite books, any favorite movies, other things you enjoy to do on your time off? Uh, yeah, I have some favorite movies, but I'm not watching movies uh, so much because it's it's like two hours movie, and uh, I do other things in that time. So what I more do more is like watch things on demand. So I'd, um, I'm very much interested in. Uh, astrophysics and uh, um, also quantum physics I, I, I mean I, I don't understand 10% of it but uh, <laughs> it's it's just a very interesting topic and thinking about how we it all came along with the universe and 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 uh, now with the new telescope and, and the images coming out and all these theories so I, I, I read a lot about uh, this aspect but it's completely out from what I do every day and I would never have a talk on it so because I don't understand but I mean, there's, uh, I think uh, Richard Feynman said, if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't understand quantum physics. So that's how it is. Maybe it's the same for CTOPC. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little less complicated from that. Um, now, what are you most excited about right now? What are the things that you are looking forward to? In general or in? in Both in personal and professional. Well, I'm really excited to, to build up the new place that I, I went to a couple of months ago. So I was um, hired as a director of the CTO and chip program. 
I'm excited to build that up there. Uh, we're just struggling with installing cameras for live cases. So I'm also looking forward to our summit in September. And hopefully we can transmit some live cases from my new place. I'm excited to have actually for the first time fellows that I can train, that I can show how things work, that I can support in their career. Uh, because previously I was just working as a regular ba day on patients, but I could not teach a, a group of people. Um, so these are the things I'm looking forward to. And what are you most proud of from the things, the many things you've done so far? My family, my kids. Um, other than that, um, you know, there's a lot of tiny things. Um, let's say about publications. I'm I'm more proud of like maybe a small case report that I really like that I did uh, draw the illustration myself, and I look back at the PDF and I, I, I remember the process, the thought process that went in, and, and the development. And I'd like to do a lot of things myself, uh, which takes more time. But usually my saying is, if you really want a good chocolate cake, make it yourself. So this is a little bit my way of thinking. And, and then I'm, I'm proud about little things. And uh, But I think you should never be too proud for too long because it slows you down. You should always go see what's next and what, what drives you next to go further. Perfect. And you've been obviously very creative. And some of those case reports you mentioned are amazing. And you know, there was the live case in MLCTO where your techniques came in very, very handy. How do you come up with these new ideas? Is it something that just pops up at a random time? Is it something you just think over it over time and just comes? How, how, how does that happen? Well, basically, I think because it's a genuine interest and it, it drives in my head some uh, like 24-7. I'm thinking about tools and, and, and uh, also one goal in my life is to invent something that it actually has a use and somebody else is using it. Uh, so that's why I came along with that sidecar technique that you were uh, mentioning. Uh, that particular thing was an idea that I had with Achim Bütner. We were talking back and forth. How could you bring down a wire? And we were thinking about a device. And then um, I thought it's it, it's probably not worth to design a device to go through all the regulations and then actually attach a price to it to just bring down a wire because you, you can also do it with a dual microcatheter. But it kept me thinking uh, if there is a way to to, uh, to facilitate that. And at that point, I actually invented it. It was uh, dissected right. I did not have dual lumen on the shelf. So I was kind of stuck to get the second wire for the PDA. And then it just popped up in my mind. Why don't I just puncture the balloon and, and I'll, I'll try it. And it worked. And then I developed uh, the, the case report. So I think it's both. It's a const constant thinking and... and uh, evaluation re-evaluation and then at one point you, you just do it and probably you ref we also refined it later on because I, th I i kept on thinking and i guess for the people on the podcast who may have seen the technique my understanding is you puncture the balloon and you get the wiring preloaded and then you advance them both together and then once you are in the location you want you just uh, pull the balloon back and uh, and re-advance the wire is that how you do it is there any uh, any special tips and tricks for making this work Yes, exactly. That's how it, it works. A it, uh, special trick is you, you take a mid-sized balloon, like a 2.0 balloon, because otherwise it would be hard to puncture it. You inflate it to four or five atmospheres, and then you puncture from the back with your radial puncture needle. And then you just park the, the, the second wire in the balloon, which is then called the sidecar. Um, and you, you then bring it, bring it forward on the, on the main wire. So you have to push the hypertube and the wire in the side, uh, in the balloon, uh, in parallel. And then when you're distal of either the dissection or the occlusion or whatever, uh, then you park it, you unpark it basically. You either retract the wire in the balloon or you advance the balloon. That's how it works. Perfect. And I also love the name. I mean, Sidecar, you know, a big part of the technique to stick with people is the good name. And I think you nailed it down on this one. This is a very good name. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, in, in terms of uh, um, things uh, that um, people should know, if someone wants to learn to do this, CTO and complex PCI, given everything you've done, what would be your advice about how to, to do this in the best possible way and learn it? Um, I think first you have to, um, think a little bit about your personality 
be, and uh, and also about the way that you're are the um, the way that you're going or the path that you're going on to. It's not something that you just do for a couple of months or years. It's I believe it's something that you you commit yourself for your for your career for your professional life. Um, so there is longevity attached to it. Also in the particular cases, they could to go forever. Uh, and all these aspects, the personality aspects that you were mentioning before, I think are really important to become a good operator. Um, and you, you, I would suggest that you think a little bit about that and you reflect yourself and, uh, and if you're that kind of personality. If yes, then of course you need to have a lot of exposure, a good mentor. I suggest you have many different people because everybody does it a little bit different. And uh, I picked, I basically cherry picked all the aspects that fit to my personality and my way of uh, my skills and my way of doing it. So I think it's it's good to not just have one person teaching you. And then obviously now it's much easier with the internet. Um, all I, I definitely suggest that people should watch all your YouTube vid videos because they're highly didactic. Um, read your book, read other books. Stefan Ranfran has a book. So the more you read, the more you see, the more you expose yourself, the, the better I think. Perfect. So any final parting thoughts uh, that you know, reflections on what you've done so far and that could potentially help other people? Um, so I didn't un quite understand the question. Oh, sorry, like uh, any final words, any final words of, uh, I know your advice about other people that you might have. Okay. Um, always do what your heart tells you to do. I think this is really important and never do something for somebody else because you can't go up, especially in C2PCI, you can't, you can't last that long if you do it for somebody else, not for yourself. Make sure that your environment personally and in also professionally is non-toxic. So everybody supports you and you support them. So it's a give and take. And then I think you can achieve the most and the capabilities are out there, uh, but you just have to have this environment, I think, and this this type of uh, motivation and and drive in in yourself that is has to been driven from yourself and not by somebody else. Wonderful. Well, Gregor, again, thank you so much. It's been phenomenal uh, talking to you and learning from you. Thank you so much as well, and uh, it's been always a pleasure to do things with you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 